Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone welcome to the course on medical biomaterials we will continue on the topic of uh, polymers okay uh, we were looking at um, many properties and uh, thermal properties of polymers also very very important because polymers the amorphous region of polymers sometimes exhibit glassy state and then sometimes they exhibit rubbery state okay the amorphous region okay so at certain temperatures that is at lower temperature the molecular molecules of polymer vibrate but not move significantly so they almost look like glass okay that is why it's called glassy state that means they become brittle hard and rigid when the temperature is raised the polymer the amorphous region of the polymer becomes a rubbery state that means uh, uh, they become soft and flexible name implies right Rub like rubber so the chains wiggle so they become like soft and flexible like rubber so the glassy state rubbery state um, that's a very very important point and um, that's known as the glass transition temperature tg tg is the glass transition temperature and above which it becomes a rubbery state and below which it will be a glassy state uh, as in mentioned it's uh, valid only for the amorph amorphous region it depends on the molecular weight of the polymer rate of heating or cooling uh, what type of measurement method i use and so on okay so uh, then melting point the crystalline portion of the polymer at some temperature starts melting that's also very important to know so just like tg okay the glass transition temperature the melting temperature um, maybe 200 degrees or 300 degrees uh, of course in biomaterial um, inside the body you are not going to face such very high temperature but still it's good to know what's the melting temperature of the polymer that's a property of the crystalline region so if the polymer is very very crystalline you will see very sh sharp melting temperature if it's very amorphous you will not see so a uh, long time back i introduced this instrument called differential scanning calorimeter or calorimetry dsc it can be used to measure all these uh, properties okay so what's so important about this temperature the temperature determines uh, the, the volume of the polymer and uh, dynamic mechanical properties of the polymer and so on for example um, if you look at crystalline solid okay the temperature um, as you increase okay and occupies more volume semi crystalline solid you will see this this is called the tg okay similarly for glassy solids you will have like this this is the tg but the dynamic mechanical properties also start going down okay you can see this so semi crystalline cross linked so as the temperature is increased uh, the e okay modulus can also start uh, decreasing okay so that is why temperature is very very important so that is why we need to understand uh, these tg and tm tm is the melting temperature so the tg when the polymer is cooled below this temperature it becomes hard like glass when it is heated above this temperature it becomes rubbery um, okay like rubber and generally uh, the heat flow was plotted against temperature when you use a dsc so it looks like this okay so there is a big uh, i mean this is called the phase change and this temperature that's in the middle of this is called the tg okay uh, so hard plastics like polystyrene polymethyl methacrylate um, okay or generally used below their tg so that it looks like a that is tg greater than 100 the tg is greater than 100 so it's used below their tg so that it looks like a glassy material uh, whereas if you look at rubber elastomers like polyisoprene polyisobutylene you need to use them above their tgs that means they will look like a rubber soft and flexible so if i am using rubbers i would like to use it above their tg and if they are using polystyrene or pmma i will use um, okay below their tg so that they look hard okay so this um, uh, table gives you tg of many 
polymers. This is taken from this reference. As you can see, some of them have Tg below their room temperature. If you take 30 as our room temperature, polyvinyl acetate, PHB, polyhydroxybutyrate. This is a um, polymer produced by bacteria, polypropylene, okay? po um, polyvinyl fluoride, polyvinylidene fluoride, rubber, they have very low Tgs. Okay? as you can see below their room temperature. Whereas, if you look at other like uh, acrylonitrile butadiene, polycarbonate, polymethyl methacrylate, polyvinyl alcohol, polyvinyl chloride, polyamides, PET, polyesters, polyethylene terephthalate, um, polystyrene, polysulfone, pot PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene, they have Tg above room temperature, about 30 degrees centigrade. Okay? Um, so, there is a lot, lot of difference um, between the Tgs as the name implies um, when you above the Tg it becomes like a soft rubbery, below the Tg it becomes hard and brittle like uh, your glass. Okay? So, you can measure Tg using a DSC, the phase change uh, it can be nicely seen in the DSC. Okay. Uh, polymer blends. The beauty of polymers is we can blend different polymers to achieve the required mechanical properties, required softening, required Tgs and so on actually. So, physical mixture of two or more polymers without, with or without any chemical bonding. Okay? So, if I am going to have two or more polymers and I put a chemical bonding uh, that can be called cross-linked. Okay? We use uh, cross-linking agents like glutaraldehyde. Whereas, if I have just physical mixture, I will not have any reaction cross-linking. Okay? So, they are called uh, homogeneous or they are called heterogeneous. Heterogeneous will be immiscible, homogeneous will be miscible on molecular level. Okay? So, when we blend it nicely, interfacial tension between the polymer phases approaches 0. Um, large interfacial tension, that means they can have a phase separation. Uh, low critical solution temperature. That means low critical solution temperature. So, um, the phase separation of a miscible blend during heating, upper critical solution temperature, phase separation of a miscible blend during cooling. Okay. So, this is during heating okay, as you can see here and uh, this is during cooling. So, this region you will have a single phase. Okay, Whereas, um, above in this region and in this region you will have two phases. So, ideally if I want to have two polymers um, well blended, uh, mixed very well, then I would like to have them in a single phase. So, I need to operate in this region of temperature. Okay. So, we can get this type of graph where you have the y axis is temperature, x axis is composition. So, I mix them together. Um, and uh, in this region of temperature, they will be in single phase. Whereas, if it goes here or here, um, this is the low critical solution temperature okay, during the heating phase and this is during cooling phase, okay, uh, where we will have the two phase separation taking place. So, I would like to work in this region. So, suppose if my room temperature is 30 degrees here, okay, I need to select the concentrations um, so that I am in the single phase region. So, we need to understand um, what is the mixing behavior of uh, two polymers, uh, so that do they form single phase or do they form two phases. Okay. So, advantages of this type of blend easy to prepare, cost effective, properties can be manipulated. That is the beauty of it. We can blend nylon and urethane. Okay. Um, so, for example, uh, urethane is like rubber, nylon is um, Okay, um, very strong, so we can achieve uh, both by mixing. And generally, blend properties will be superior to the individual properties. So we can achieve uh, um, advantages of both the polymers into this blend. Okay, uh, some examples: PVC, it's got poor impact resistance; it's brittle. Okay, it can break. So what do they do? Uh, they add ethylene vinyl acetate copolymer. Okay. So, improved toughness and impact. So, it will not be brittle, some flexibility is there, that is why it is used in medical films, blood bags. Um, so, PVC alone, if you use, it is very brittle, 
it is not flexible. So, they add ethylene vinyl acetate copolymer okay, of this. So, it can be used for bed bags or films or tubings and so on. Polyesters okay, shrinks they have problems with dimensions maintaining their dimensions. So, when you add polycarbonate it gives you good stability it reduces shrinkage again it is used in blood therapy, drug delivery, intravenous kits, components, flexible medical tubing, surgical instruments because polycarbonate is very tough okay. it is called an engineering plastic. So, it can be used for strong application surgically. Uh, acrylic nitrile butadiene styrene this is like a rubber okay. it is low heat distortion temperature. So, they add polycarbonate, polycarbonate has very good uh, temperature resistance so of course, uh, then we can use it for housing of material, surgical instruments, diagnostic devices, drug delivery and so on actually. Okay. Um, so, okay. so, polycarbonate I was talking about, uh, so this is the structure of polycarbonate, this is the repeating unit of polycarbonate. Okay. How is it made? Diphenyl carbonate that is here diphenyl carbonate okay, and bisphenol A that is how you make diphenyl carbonate and bisphenol A it gives you polycarbonate and it gives you phenol. Okay. It is called an engineering process plastic um, temperature resistance, impact resistance and um, transparent can undergo large deformations without cracking or breaking it is used in heart lung assist devices coating of contact lenses. Okay. So, polycarbonate is um, uh, it is almost like glass you can see through um, so it is used in some of those applications okay, coating on contact lenses and so on actually. Um, it is also used for high, high impact strong uh, uh, medical devices. Another polymer which I mentioned just now polyurethane um, this is like rubber okay. this is the polyurethane. Okay, it is a condensation of dye or polyisocyanide uh, with the polyol, polyol is a alcohol when I say polyol it is an alcohol here this portion is polyol this is the isocyanide here see this is isocyanide bond this is the poly alcohol bond. So, it is a soft elastomeric uh, applications used for foams encapsulating hollow fiber devices, deep molded gloves, balloons asymmetric membranes, functional coatings, um, extrusion for catheters, artificial heart, pacemaker lead, um, even ureteral stents and so on. So, polyurethane um, this is a very soft elastomer, polycarbonate very hard engineering plastic. Okay. So, uh, let us look at a problem, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene is used in knee or hip joint prosthesis, okay. its molecular weight is too into 10 power 6 gram per mole and uh, because it is polyethylene it is got only uh, CH2, CH2 as repeating. So, uh, it has got say CH2, CH2 as repeating. Now, calculate the number of these repeat units, how do you do that? It is quite simple, um, weight of one repeat unit. So, it has got 2 carbons into 12, 12 is the atomic weight and then it has got 4 hydrogen 4, so 2 into 12 is 24 plus 4 is 28. Um, so, how do we calculate number of repeat units? Its molecular weight is 2 into 10 power 6 okay, divided by 28 that will give you 71,428 this repeat units. Okay. Now, calculate M n that is the number average molecular weight if polydisplicity is 1.5. So, the weight average is this um, I mentioned before that uh, weight by number average is equal to the polydispersity 1.5. So, it is quite straightforward. So, polydispersity is 2 into 10 power 6 divided by 1.5 that is 1.33 into 10 power 6. Third part calculate the length of a stretched chain. Okay. So, this um, polyethylene high ultra high molecular weight polyethylene it occupies a tetrahedral structure. So, the C C C bond length of 0.126. Okay. You, we have uh, 3 carbons as the repeat unit. So, we need to calculate the mass of that which is 3 into 12 plus 1 into 6. So, we have the molecular weight as 2 10 power 6 and divided by 42. So, that leads to 
47619 has the repeat units and uh, if you multiply that with the 0.126 we get uh, 6000 nanometers which is 6 microns okay so look at it polyethylene it forms a tetrahedral whereas if you look at polytetrafluoroethylene uh, which is uh, uh, there are no hydrogens only fluorine 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 so you have c c uh, cf2 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 connected together it forms a rhombohedral whereas uh, polyethylene which has got ch2 ch2 it forms a tetrahedral so these are fluoro fluorine atoms okay your 15 repeat unit of ptfe has a hexagonal structure um, with the a uh, that is the side of the hexagon 5.65 angstroms and c um, that is the height of the hex hexagonal structure 19.5 calculate its theoretical density okay so mass 15 into 12 is the carbon okay um, f2 cf2 right fluorine is 19 into 2 uh, divided by 6.023 into 10 power 23 that is the Avogadro number. So, when we do this calculation 1.25 into 10 power minus 25 gram per mole. Why do we do this? 15 repeat units and each repeat unit has a CF2, CF2 and so on right. C is the carbon 12 F2 that is why 2 into fluorine okay, divided by the Avogadro number that gives you the mass of this 15 repeat unit in mole per mole. Now, the volume, volume of an hexagon square root of 3 divided by 2 a square c, a square is 5.65 square, c is 19.5. So, that comes out to be this cc per mole. So, mass by mole density is 2.31 gram per cc. Okay. Okay, so, composites, what is this composites? So, we can have um, a combination of microscopic scale of two or more materials um, okay, which have uh, general physical properties. So, I can put in uh, um, glass beads in polymers, I can put in uh, carbon fibers into the polymers. Okay. Um, you must have heard about uh, uh, fiber reinforced plastics, we have, you must have heard about uh, carbon reinforced plastics. Okay. So, we can have very fine carbon particles put into some polymers, we can even put fibers into uh, polymethyl metacrylates. So, that adds to the uh, tensile strength. Okay. So, we can tailor depending upon the specific application. For example, boat parts are made of uh, fiber reinforced PMMA and they are extremely strong. These fibers when they are aligned in certain direction it adds quite a lot to the tensile strength. Similarly, we can have glass beads or even carbon um, mixed with polymer to make these composites and that adds quite a lot of strength mechanical properties to the polymer. Okay, so, um, polymer ceramic composites for example, uh, collagen hydroxapidate, collagen is a polymer hydroxapidate is an inorganic material. So, the add to each other and uh, they give lot of strength. They are used in dental and bone applications. Okay. Uh, polymer it will promote cell growth, the ceramic is bioactive. Polymer can degrade without leaving any foreign substance, whereas the ceramic is not going to be degrading. They may be helping in osteoconductive, osteoinductive properties. Okay. So, by adding this you can see the, the advantages of both are taken in the ceramic could be bioactive, they be oste osteoconductive, osteoinductive, polymers do not have that property, but polymers can uh, promote cell growth, they can also degrade without leaving any foreign substance over a long period of time. So, we can nicely use them for tissue engineering purposes, bone growth purposes. Of course, uh, uh, polymers do not have good mechanical properties and they are also not bioactive that is taken care by this ceramic. Ceramics are brittle, so they cannot take over load bearing applications whereas polymers are much better than these ceramics. So, this is a very good example of polymer ceramic complex and lot of dental bone applications um, have this type of uh, combinations. So, polymers are reinforced with inorganic, it could be calcium sulphate, alumina, hydroxyapatite, 
um, the after all you are bone is a polymer ceramic composite right. Uh, they can give better cell response, they will have very good mechanical properties, improved tissue integration. So, this type of combination also has uh, some usefulness and advantages. Few examples of uh, polymer ceramic type 1 collagen combined with hydroxyapatite or, or tricalcium phosphate. They can be used for long bone fractures, traumatic osteosis defects, bone void fillers. So, in a bone void sometimes we can fill it up only with the inorganic material, but then um, they could be brittle. So, we add collagen to that. Similarly, type 1 collagen or chondroitin 6 sulphate with hydroxyapatite. This is used in dental, periodontal effects, pre prosthetic osseous reconstruction, maxiofacial reconstructive surgery after a uh, um, trauma, the facial reconstruction, we can uh, combine this type of uh, composites. Fibrin biphasic calcium phosphate, again bone void filler. Collagen tricalcium phosphate, filling, bridging, reconstruction okay, and bone fusion. Collagen magnesium enriched hydroxapatite nanocrystals. Okay. So, magnesium uh, ha is also bioresorbable. Okay. So, we can think about long bone fractures, hip arthroplasty to fill actobular defect. So, you see um, we can use uh, uh, calcium, um, tricalcium phosphates, we can use hydroxyphidates, okay, calcium phosphates with collagen generally uh, for bone applications, filling up of voids, long bone segmental defects and also for dental orthodontic applications because uh, your uh, inorganic material cannot bear loads. So, we need collagen, but uh, the beauty of uh, the inorganic material is they are osteoconductive, osteointegrative. So, we can um, use them. So, this type of combinations um, are very, very advantages each helping each another. Okay, Let us uh, look at one simple problem related to these composites. Look at this, finely ground silica that is a density is used as a filler for polydimethoxy siloxane which has a density of 0.9. Okay. This is a polymer, this is the structure of this polymer, polydimethoxy, dimethoxy siloxane, silica is there o, that is why it is called siloxane. It is optically clear, inert, non-toxic, good flow properties, non-flammable, it is used quite a lot in cosmetic consumer product industry, it is used as filler in breast implants. So, because of its clarity, it is used widely in cosmetic. Okay. That is this. Now, question is I am mixing silica with PDMS. So, what volume fraction of silica is needed to make this silastic rubber, because PDMS is very rubbery to achieve a density of 1.25. So, we have a silica density 2.65, siloxane that the polymer PDMS density 0.9. So, I want to achieve this density of 1.25. What should be the volume fraction of silica I need to add? Okay. So, um, same thing what volume fraction of silica is required to make the silastic rubber with density of this. Um, this problem was taken from this uh, reference book. Okay. Uh, so, what do we do? It is called a mixture of uh, mixture rule that is the density of the composite, um, density of component 1, the volume fraction of component 1, density of component 2, volume fraction. So, I want to achieve 1.25, silica is 2.65, uh, siloxane is 0 0.9. Okay. So, what should be the volume fraction of silica? Now, this fraction and this fraction is equal to 1 that everybody knows right. So, V PDMS we can put 1 minus V silica. So, so from that we can calculate volume fraction of silica. Volume fraction of silica is 0 0.2. So, I need 0 0.2 volume fraction or 20 percent silica uh, to uh, achieve a density of 1.25 for the composite. Okay. When I say 20 percent silica the 80 percent is this polymer PDMS interesting problem. 
what is the weight percent of silica? Okay, so, this is volume fraction. So, I need to calculate the weight percent that is also very simple. Okay, weight of 1 cc of rubber uh, is uh, 1.25 grams okay. and the volume fraction is 0 0.2. Okay, so, volume fraction is 0 0.2, weight is this much. So, we can calculate 0 0.2 into 2.65 divided by 1.25, 2.65 divided by 1.25. Okay, that gives you 0 0.42. So, I need to add 42 percent by weight of silica, whereas I need to add 20 percent by volume of silica. Why 42 percent? Because density of silica is very high, that is why weight wise it is very high. Okay. An isotropic composite which contains spherical silica particles, the modulus is 72 giga Pascal in a polymer which is 1 giga Pascal. Now, I am adding this 33 percent by volume of this into the polymer, what is the modulus of the composite? Okay. So, there are uh, some equations available in literature, one equation is this Gibson and Ashby especially for dilute material, uh, spherical material if you add and as achieve a isotropic composite, this is the equation that is given E that is modulus of this composite 1 plus 5. E i that is the inclusion material which you are going to add and this is the m of the polymer, the V i is the volume fraction divided by 3 plus 2 E i by E m. E i is the inclusion material you are adding, E m is the polymer material. This is taken from this reference. So, we just have to substitute 5 um, 72 minus 1 uh, 33 percent here 3 plus 2. Um, again 72 by 1 that gives you 1.8 giga Pascal. That is the um, modulus of this particular composite when you have 33 percent of silica and rest is the polymer 33 percent by volume. Now, long time back I mentioned about Roy's model right. Okay, this is the Roy's model where uh, um, the E that is the modulus is given by 1 divided by um, sorry. 1 divided by okay, 1 divided by 0.33 that is the volume fraction divided by 72 plus 0.67 is the volume fraction of the polymer divided by 1 that gives you 1.5 giga Pascal. So, um, some difference you can see so depending upon the type of model which we use uh, we can get slightly difference in the number of the composites. Okay. So, let us look at uh, another problem, average bond energy of carbon chlorine in PVC as you know polyvinyl chloride, it contains lot of uh, chlorine or uh, the bond energy of the CCL is 340 kilojoule per mole. Now, can visible light which has got a lambda of 4000 to 7000 angstrom have enough energy to break the bond. So, we need to calculate whether the energy is greater than 340 so that it can break the bond. Okay. This can happen especially when I have uh, uh, biomaterial and uh, which is made up of PVC and I am trying to um, sterilize it using UV radiation, will the bonds get broken? I need to do that. So, from with respect to that uh, is a very, very important problem. So, what do we do? Uh, you remember this equation E is equal to H C by lambda. Okay. H is your Planck's constant. C is the way, um, wavelength, uh, the um, light, okay, the speed of light, lambda is uh, this, okay, that is the wavelength. So, C is the speed of light, lambda is the wavelength, H is the Planck constant that gives you energy. Planck constant is given by 6.626 10 power minus 34 joule second, uh, C is the speed of light, so many meter per second. Okay. Uh, that is 3 into 10 power 10 centimeter per second. Lambda, let us take uh, the smallest 4000 um, angstrom, that is 4000 10 power minus 8 centimeter. Avogadro number is 6.023 10 power 23. So, energy per mole 6.023 into 10 power 23, 6.626 10 power minus 34. C is 3 into 10 power raised to the power 10 divided by lambda 4000 
minus 8. So, that gives you 299,000 joule or 299 kilo joule. So, per mole, so the which is not enough, okay. Average bond energy is 340, so I need to achieve 340, but I got only 299. So, if the if I am using a light whose wavelength is 4000 to 7000, then I will not break the CL bond, whereas if the lambda is going to be much less than this 4000, okay. For example, uh, if uh, another 30 or 40 percent less, then this number may go up 30 or 40 percent, okay. So, I may uh, come very close to this and uh, chances are I may be breaking the bond of C and CL, okay. This is a very interesting problem. So, if I am using a, a visible light uh, of wavelength uh, 4000, then I will not be breaking this CL. But if I am going down say maybe 3000 or less, um, then the bond between C and C L can break, okay. So, this is also another very interesting problem uh, worth uh, pondering about. So, we did quite a lot of uh, uh, in the past three lectures um, on polymers, looked at different types of polymers, uh, applications of polymers in different uh, uh, areas of biomaterial um, and implants, then some properties of polymers um, and um, also we looked at a few simple problems uh, which gives you some idea about uh, uh, polymer and their application area. Thank you very much for your time.